Kicking, good to see you. How are you doing? How was school today? Oh, I don't know if you saw, but um, I officially changed the channel points to now they are pages. And I have a few custom ones in there. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm doing all right, too. Uh, allergies are a little better today than they were uh, yesterday or the day before. At least my... Um, my neck and back aren't, you know, feeling too awful today. Although I am a little... Oh, read a random fact. Alrighty. Let us. So this is from the book 1411. Quite interesting facts to knock, your, uh, to knock you sideways. So, the first soccer rule book, or football rule book, in Argentina stated that a player who had been fooled, or fouled, sorry, could accept an apology rather than involve the referee. Oh my gosh, I love that. <laughs> I have no clue what allergies I have, but uh, there are like a million trees here, a million grasses and flowers and all that stuff. So, you know, probably any number of those guys. And it just kind of, you know, clogs up the system. Uh, and I didn't know that I had them for the longest time until, uh, you know, I kept going in every year um, to, <laughs> yeah, I know, <laughs> I love these facts. Uh, I kept every year getting sick around the same time and I went to my doctor and she's like, oh, yeah, uh, so you're not actually getting a cold. Well, you are getting a cold, but that is from allergies having aggravated uh, your sinus and then your um, uh, tonsils and all of that stuff and then that made you cold because you weren't taking care of it so now you know I, I take care of it pretty well it keeps it manageable uh, but I do have a few food sensitivities but the biggest one that I do stay away from um, is alcohol. I do not drink any alcohol because it makes my face just break out with this bad rosacea and I started to get uh, damaged skin on my face so I just stopped drinking. That's taking care of it. Uh, what do you think I should do for my uh, after story time stream kick in? Should I do an art stream or a game stream? Oh, yeah. <laughs> vodka is not fun. Now, a couple of my friends were vodka people, and I did not understand how they could do it. But that's just me, you know. Okay, yeah. A nice chill game. Uh, I do have quite a few of those. Um, we have Short Hike and Stardew and, uh, like, any other number of things. But we can figure out what we're going to play then. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> you, your soul still burns from it. <laughs> Probably. All right. Well, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started, but I will reply um, between chapters. So we're starting a new book today. Stardew, like it takes some getting used to. You kind of have to think, what do I want to designate today to? Is this going to be a farming day? Is this going to be um, a like battle day? Are we going to go spelunking? You know, that sort of thing. Hi, Regent. How are you doing? Oh, that is such a cute little uh, emote there. By the way, thank you for the follow six days ago. <laughs> I don't think I got a chance to say that. 
Uh, since you followed, I, um, I don't know if you saw, I am now an affiliate. So I have now the channel points, the pages, which you can redeem. Nice. I'm doing all right. You know, allergy, this is a, an acceptable allergy day for me. I was just telling Kicken, um, oh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much for the cheers. For the bits. I'm I'm so happy. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know it's been it's been kind of a chill day, uh, and I have been doing so many emotes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you've been with me uh, and the uh, the story time community for quite a while, kicking. By the way, Regent, I don't know if uh, you knew or not. I do have a Discord. I'm going to do that there. And look, my little um, subscriber badge. So I figured that it would be fitting to have a new color per step of the way so you can count up. Hey, you are number one in bits. Nice. So today I'm going to be starting a new story, and with the Oz books, it's pretty consistent. You can read um, a story in, in two two-hour story times. Yeah. So just a little, uh, oops, I misspelling. Yeah, there we go. Eventually, there will be an emote at the end of that. It's still pending, but I've been having so much fun making those emotes. So I'm going to go ahead and get started, and we are starting The Road to Oz. Chapter 1. The Way to Butterfield. Please, miss, said the cha shaggy man, can you please tell me the road to Butterfield? Dorothy looked him over. Yes, he was shaggy, all right, but there was a twinkle in his eye that seemed pleasant. Oh, yes, she replied. I can tell you, but it isn't this road at all. No? No, you cross the ten-acre lot, follow the lane to the highway, go north to the five branches, and take, uh, let's see, to be sure, miss, uh, see as far as Butterfield, if you like, said the shaggy man. Uh, you take the branch next to the willow stump, I believe, or else the branch by the gopher holes, or else... Won't any of them do, miss? Course not, shaggy man. You must take the right road to get to Butterfield. And is that the one by the gopher stump, or... Dear me, cried Dorothy. I shall have to show you the way. You're so stupid. Wait a minute till I run in the house and get my sunbonnet. The shaggy man waited. He had an oat straw in his mouth, which he chewed slowly as if it tasted good, but it didn't. There was an apple tree beside the house, and some apples had fallen to the ground. The shaggy man thought they would taste better than the oat straw, so he walked over to get some. A little black dog with bright brown eyes. Oh, sorry, I forgot to change the picture. Uh, there we go. <laughs> I forgot to change over to my story time picture. Uh, let's see. So now you can see my little drawing of Dorothy with uh, Toto in her arms. The little dog barked and made a dive for the shaggy man's leg, but he grabbed the dog by the neck and put it in his big pocket along with the apples. He's stealing Toto. He took more apples afterwards, but many were on the ground, and each one that he tossed into his pocket hit the little dog somewhere upon the head or back and made him growl. The little dog's name was Toto, and he was sorry he had been put in the shaggy man's pocket. Pretty soon Dorothy came out of the house with her sunbonnet, and she called out, Come on, shaggy man, if you want me to show you the road to Butterfield. <clears throat> she climbed the fence into the ten-acre lot, and he followed her, walking slowly and stumbling over the little hillocks in the pasture as if he was thinking of something else and did not notice them. My, but you're clumsy, said the little girl. Are your feet tired? No, miss, it's my whiskers. They tire very easily in this warm weather, said he. I wish it would snow, don't you? Of course not, shaggy man, 
replied Dorothy, giving him a severe look. If it snowed in August, it would spoil the corn and the oats and the wheat, and then Uncle Henry wouldn't have any crops, and that would make him poor, and never mind, said the shaggy man. It won't snow, I guess. Is this the lane? Yes, replied Dorothy, climbing another fence. I'll go as far as the highway with you. Thank you, miss. You're very kind for your size, I'm sure, said he gratefully. It isn't everyone who knows the road to Butterfield, Dorothy remarked as she tripped along the lane. But I've driven there many a time with Uncle, uh, Uncle Henry, and so I believe I could find it blindfolded. Don't do that, miss, said the shaggy man earnestly. You might make a mistake. I won't, she replied, and, uh, laughing. Here's the highway. Now, uh, it's the second, no, the third turn to the left, or else it's the fourth. Oh, I think it is, I think it's up times. Yeah, there we go. I've heard, I've seen Corel use it a few times. Uh, now it's the second, uh, no, the, the third turn to the left, or else it's the fourth. Let's see. The first one is by the elm tree, and the second is by the gopher holes, and then... Then what? he inquired, putting his hands in his po uh, coat pockets. Toto grabbed a finger and bit it, and the shaggy man took his hand out of that pocket quickly and said, Oh! Dorothy did not notice. Uh, let's see. Dorothy did not notice. She was shading her eyes from the sun with her arm, looking anxiously down the road. Come on, she commanded. It's only a little way further, so I may as well show you. After a while, they came to the place where five roads branched in different directions. Dorothy pointed to one and said, That's it, Shaggy Man. I'm much obliged to you, miss, he said, and started an along another road. Not that one, she cried. You're going wrong. He stopped. I thought you said that other was the road to Butterfield, said he, running his fingers through his shaggy whiskers in a puzzled way. So it is. But I don't want to go to Butterfield, miss. You don't? Of course not. I wanted you to show me the road, so I shouldn't go there by mistake. Oh, where do you want to go then? I'm not particular, miss. Except he is particular. This answer astonished the little girl, and it made her provoked, uh, too, to think that she had taken all this trouble for nothing. There are many good, uh, good many roads here, observed the shaggy man, turning slowly. Oh, hey, Reaper, good to see you. Had my days all right. How was yours? Let's see. Oh, and uh, I don't know if you saw Reaper. We got affiliates. So now we do have uh, the channel points down here, which are pages. There are good many roads here, observed the shaggy man, turning slowly around like a human windmill. Seems to me a person could go most anywhere from this place. Dorothy turned round too and gazed in surprise. There were a good many roads, more than she had ever seen before. She tried to count them knowing there ought to be five, but when she had counted seventeen, she grew bewildered and stopped, for the roads were as many as the spokes of a wheel and ran in every direction from the place where they stood. So she kept on counting she was uh, so if she kept on counting she was likely to count some of the roads twice dear me she exclaimed there used to be only five roads highway and all and now why there's the high where's the highway shaggy man can't say miss he responded sitting down upon the ground as if tired but withstanding wasn't it here a minute ago i thought so she answered greatly perplexed and I saw the gopher holes, too, and the dead stump, but they're not here now. These roads are all strange, and what a lot of them there are. Where do you suppose they all go to? Roads, observed the shaggy man, don't go anywhere. They stay in one place so folks can walk on them. Oh, thank you very much, Reaper. He put his hand in his side pocket and drew out an apple, quick before Toto could bite him again. The little dog got his head out this time and said, wah, wah, so loudly that it made Dorothy jump. Oh, Toto, she cried, where did you come from? I brought him along, said the shaggy man. 
What for? she asked. To guard these apples in my pocket, miss, so no one would steal them. With one hand the shaggy dog held the apple, which he began eating, while with the other hand he pulled Toto out of his pocket and dropped him to the ground. Of course Toto made for Dorothy at once, barking joyfully at his release from the dark pocket. When the child had patted his head lovingly, he sat down before her, his red tongue hanging out one side of his mouth, and looked up into her face with his bright brown eyes as if asking her what they should do next. Dorothy didn't know. She looked around her anxiously for some familiar landmark, but everything was strange. Between the branches of the many roads were green meadows and a few shrubs and trees, but she couldn't see anywhere the farmhouse uh, anywhere the farmhouse from which she had just come from, or anything she had ever seen before except the shaggy man and Toto. Besides this, she had turned round and round so many times trying to find out where she was that now she couldn't even tell which direction the farmhouse ought to be in, and this began to worry her and make her feel anxious. I'm afraid, shaggy man, she said with a sigh, that we're lost. Ah, oh, that's nothing to be afraid of, he replied, throwing away the core of his apple and beginning to eat another one. Each of these roads must lead somewhere, so it wouldn't be here. So where does it matter? Uh, so what does it matter? I wouldn't, I want to go home again, she said. Well, why don't you, said he. I don't know which road to take. That's too bad, he said, shaking his shaggy head gravely. I wish I could help you, but I can't. I'm a stranger in these parts. Seems as if I were too, she said, sitting down beside him. It's funny, a few minutes ago I was home, and I just came to show you the way to Butterfield, so I shouldn't make a mistake and go there. And now I've lost myself, and I don't know how to get home. Have an apple, suggested the shaggy man, handing her one, with pretty red cheeks. I'm not hungry, said Dorothy, pushing it away. But you may be tomorrow. Then you'll be sorry you didn't eat the apple, said he. If I am, I'll eat the apple then, promised Dorothy. Perhaps there won't be any apple then, he returned, beginning to eat the red-cheeked one himself. Dogs sometimes can find their way home better than people, he went on. Perhaps your dog can lead you back to the farm. Will you, Toto? asked Dorothy. Toto wagged his tail vigorously. All right, said the girl, let's go home. Toto looked around a minute and dashed up one of the roads. Goodbye, shaggy man, called Dorothy and ran after Toto. The little dog pranced briskly along for some distance when he turned around and looked at his mistress questioningly. Oh, don't expect me to tell you anything. I don't know the way, she said. You'll have to find it yourself. But Toto couldn't. He wagged his tail and sneezed and shook his ears and trotted back where they had left the shaggy man. From here he started along another road, then came back and tried another, but each time he found the way strange and decided it would not take them to the farmhouse. Finally, when Dorothy had begun to tire with chasing after him, Toto sat down panting beside the shaggy man and gave up. So Dorothy sat down too, very thoughtful. The little girl had encountered some queer adventures since she had come to live at the farm, but this was the queerest of them all. To get lost in fifteen minutes so near to her home and in the unromantic state of Kansas was an experience that fairly bewildered her. "'Will your folks worry?' asked the shaggy man, his eyes twinkling in a pleasant way. "'I suppose so,' answered Dorothy with a sigh. Uncle Henry says there's always something happening to me, but I've always come home safe at the last. So perhaps he'll take comfort and think I'll come home safe this time. I'm sure you will, said the shaggy man, smiling, uh, smilingly nodding at her. Good little girls never come to any harm, you know. For my part, I'm good too, so nothing ever hurts me. I don't know how he's good. He stole a bunch of apples and he stole Toto. Hmm. Dorothy looked at him curiously. His clothes were shaggy, his boots were shaggy, and full of holes. Oh, thanks, John. Good to see you. Thanks for hanging out. I'll reply um, after the chapter. 
His clothes were shaggy, his boots were shaggy and full of holes, and his hair and whiskers were shaggy, but his smile was sweet and his eyes were kind. Why didn't you want to go to Butterfield? she asked. Because a man lives there who owes me fifteen cents, and if I went to Butterfield and he saw me, he'd want to pay me money. I don't want money, my dear. Why not? she inquired. Money, declared the shaggy man, makes people proud and haughty. I don't want to be proud and haughty. All I want is to have people love me, and as long as I owe the love magnet, everyone I meet is sure to love me dearly. The love magnet? Well, what's that? I'll show you if you won't tell anyone, he answered in a low, mysterious voice. There isn't anyone to tell except Toto, said the girl. The shaggy man searched in one pocket carefully, and in another pocket, and in a third. At last he drew out a small parcel wrapped in crumpled paper and tied with a cotton string. He unwound the string, opened the parcel, and took out a bit of metal shaped like a horseshoe. It was dull and brown and not very pretty. This, my dear, he said impressively, is the wonderful love magnet. It was given to me by an Eskimo in the Sandwich Islands where there are no sandwiches at all, and as long as I carry it, every living thing I meet will love me dearly. Why didn't the Eskimo keep it? she asked, looking at the magnet with interest. He got tired of being loved and longed for someone to hate him, so he gave me the magnet, and the very next day a grizzly bear ate him. Wasn't he sorry then? she inquired. He didn't say, replied the shaggy man, wrapping and tying the love magnet with great care and putting it away in another pocket. But the bear didn't seem sorry a bit, he added. Do you know the bear? asked Dorothy. Yes, we used to play ball sometime in the great Cavalier Islands. The bear loved me because I had the love magnet. I couldn't blame him for eating the Eskimo because it was his nature to do so. Once, said Dorothy, I knew a hungry tiger who longed to eat fat babies because it was his nature too, but he never ate any because he had a conscience. This bear, replied the shaggy man with a sigh, had no conscience, you see. The shaggy man sat silent for several minutes, apparently considering the cases of the bear and the tiger, while Toto watched him with an air of great interest. The little dog was doubtless thinking of his ride in the shaggy man's pocket and planning to keep out of reach in the future. At last the shaggy man turned and inquired, What's your name, little girl? My name's Dorothy, said she, jumping up again. But what are we going to do? We can't live here forever, you know, or we can't stay here forever, you know. Let's take the seventh road, he suggested. Seven is a lucky number for a little girls named Dorothy. Seventh from where? From where you begin to count. So she counted seven rows, and the seventh looked just like all the other, but the shaggy man got up from the ground where he had been sitting and started down this row as if sure it was the best way to go, and Dorothy and Toto followed him. <clears throat> but yeah, thanks so much, John, for the congrats. I was, uh, I've been uh, having fun making emotes ever since. I actually had a dream about making emotes last night. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to, you know, um, working on the cheer, uh, like top cheer badge and stuff like that. It's the, I think it, it was the cat treats that I was going to have be the tier, uh, cheer tier thing. And then cat in a box is going to be for like hype train. I haven't started um, making the, well, I haven't started finishing the art yet, but last night I finished the pages art, so you can see it on channel points. Chapter 2. Dorothy Meets Button Bright. The seventh road was a good road, and carved this way and that. Oh, I have, yes, I, um, I submitted the first three tier emote. So we have cat on a book for number one. Uh, number two is the cat head in a heart. And then number three is cat hiding in a bag. And eventually they will be story T 17. Oh, story T 15. Is that it? I don't know. They haven't, um, 
been approved yet, though. Maybe it is 17. I'll have to double check. Yeah. The seventh road was a good road and curved this way and that, winding through green meadows and fields covered with daisies and buttercups and past groups of shady trees. There were no homes of any sort to be seen, and for some distance they met with no living creature at all. Dorothy began to fear they were getting a good way from the farmhouse, since here everything was strange to her, but it would do no good at all to go back where the other roads all met, because the next one they chose might lead her just as far from her home. She kept on besides the shaggy man who whistled cheerful tunes to beguile the journey, until by and by they followed a turn in the road and saw before them a big chestnut tree making a shady spot over the highway. In the shade, just a little. Uh, oh, in the shade sat a little boy dressed in sailor clothes who was digging a hole in the earth with a bit of wood. He must have been digging some time because the hole was already big enough to drop a football into. Dorothy and Toto and the shaggy man came to a halt before the little boy who kept on digging in a sober and persistent fashion. Who are you? asked the girl. He looked up at her calmly. His face was round and chubby, and his eyes were big, blue, and earnest. I'm Button Bright, said he. But what's your real name, she inquired. Button Bright. That isn't a really, truly name, she exclaimed. Isn't it? he asked, still digging. Of course not. It's just a, a, a thing to call you by. You must have a name. Must I? To be sure. What did your mama call you? He paused in his digging and tried to think. Papa always said I was bright as Button, so Mama always called me Bob, uh, Button Bright, he said. What is your Papa's name? Just Papa. What else? Don't know. Never mind, said the shaggy man, smiling. We'll call the boy Button Bright, as his Mama does. That name is as good as any and better than some. Dorothy watched the boy dig. Where do you live, she asked. Don't know, was the reply. How did you come here? Don't know, he said again. Don't you know where you came from? No, said he. Why, well, he must be lost, she said to the, faggy, uh, the, the shaggy man. Oh my goodness, that was a slip. <laughs> Why, he must be lost, she said to the shaggy man. He turned to the boy once more. What are you going to do, she inquired. Dig, said he. But you can't dig forever. And what are you going to do then, she persisted. Dunno, said the boy. But you must know something, declared Dorothy, getting provoked. Must I? he asked, looking up in surprise. Of course you must. What do I? Uh, what must I know? What's going to become of you, for one thing, she answered. Do you know what's going to become of me? he asked. Not, not exactly, she admitted. Do you know what's going to become of you? he continued earnestly. Can't say I do, replied Dorothy, remembering her present difficulties. The shaggy man laughed. No one knows anything, Dorothy, he said. But Button Bright doesn't seem to know anything, she declared. Do you, uh, do you, Button Bright? He shook his head, which had pretty curls all over it, and replied with perfect calmness, Don't know. Never before had Dorothy met with someone who could give her so little information. The boy was evidently lost, and his people would be sure to worry about him. He seemed two or three years younger than Dorothy, and was prettily dressed, as if someone loved him dearly and took much pains to make him look well. How then did he come to be in this lonely road, she wondered. Near Button Bride on the ground was a sailor hat with a gilt arc uh, anchor on the band. His sailor trousers were long and wide at the bottom, and the broad collar of his blouse had gold anchors sewed on its corners. The boy was still digging at his hole. "'Have you ever been to sea?' asked Dorothy. "'To see what?' Re answered Button Bright. "'I mean, have you ever been where there's water?' "'Yes,' said Button Bright. "'There's a well in our backyard.' "'You don't understand,' cried Dorothy. "'I mean, have you ever been on a big ship floating in a big ocean?' "'Don't know,' said he. "'And why do you wear the sailor's clothes?' "'Don't know,' he answered again. "'Dorothy was in despair. "'You're just awful stupid, Button Bright,' she said. 
Am I? he asked. Yes, you are. Why? Looking up at her with big, bright eyes. She was going to say don't know, but stopped herself in time. That's for you to answer, she replied. It's no use asking Button Bright questions, said the shaggy man, who had been eating another apple. Someone ought to take care of the, the poor little chap, don't you think? So he'd better come along with us. Toto had been looking with great curiosity in the hole which the boy was digging, and growing more and more excited every minute, perhaps thinking that Button Bright was after some wild animal. The little dog began barking loudly and jumped into the hole himself, where he began to dig with his tiny paws, making the earth fly in all directions. It spattered over the boy. Dorothy seized him and raised him to his feet, brushing his clothes with her hand. Stop that, Toto, she called. There aren't any mice or woodchucks in that hole, so don't be foolish. Toto stopped, sniffed at the hole suspiciously, and jumped out of it, wagging his tail as if he had done something important. Well, said the shaggy man, let's start off or we won't get anywhere before night comes. Where do you expect to get to? asked Dorothy. I'm like Button Bright, I don't know, answered the shaggy man with a laugh. But I've learned from long experience that every road leads somewhere, or there wouldn't be any road, so it's likely that if we travel long enough, my dear, we will come to some place or another in the end. What place it will be, we can't even guess at this moment, but we're sure to find out when we get there. Why, yes, said Dorothy. Seems reasonable, Shaggy Man. Chapter 3 A Queer Village Button Bright took the Shaggy Man's hand willingly, for the, ba uh, the Shaggy Man had the love magnet, you know, which was the reason Button Bright had loved him at once. All this time reading it, my brain is going, Stranger Danger! Stranger Danger! But they didn't think about those things and, uh, at that time, or, you know, it wasn't widely thought. They started on with Dorothy on one side and Toto on the other, and the little party trudged along more cheerfully than they might have supposed. The girl was getting used to queer adventures, which interested her very much. Wherever Dorothy met, went, Toto was sure to go, like Mary's little lamb. Button Bright didn't seem a bit afraid or worried because he was lost, and the shaggy man had no home, perhaps, and was as happy in one place as in another. Before long, they saw ahead of them a fine, big arch spanning the road, and when they came nearer, they found that the arch was beautifully carved and decorated with rich colors. A row of peacocks with spread tails ran along the top of it, and all the feathers were gorgeously painted. In the center was a large fox's head, and the fox wore a shrewd and knowing expression, and had large spectacles over its eyes, and a small golden crown with shiny points on top of its head. While the travelers were looking with curiosity at this beautiful arch, there suddenly marched out of it a company of soldiers, only the soldiers were all foxes dressed in uniforms. They wore green jackets and yellow pantaloons, and their little round caps with their high boots were a bright red color. Also, there was a big red bow tied about the middle of each long, bushy tail. Each soldier, soldier was armed with a wooden sword, having an edge of sharp teeth set in a row, and the, size of, the sight of those teeth at first caused Dorothy to shudder. A captain marched in front of the company of fox soldiers, its uniform embroidered with gold braid to make it handsomer than the, the others. Almost before our friends realized it, the soldiers had surrounded them on all sides, and the captain was calling out in a harsh voice, Surrender! You are our prisoners! What's a prisoner? asked Button Bright. A prisoner is a captive, replied the fox captain, strutting up and down with much dignity. What's a captive? asked Button Bright. You're one, said the captain. That made the shaggy man laugh. Good afternoon, captain, he said, bowing politely to all the foxes and very low to their commander. I trust you are in good health and that your families are all well. The fox captain looked at the shaggy man and his sharp features grew pleasant and smiling. 
We're pretty well, thank you, Shaggy Man, he said, and Dorothy knew that the love magnet was working and that all the foxes now loved the Shaggy Man because of it. But Toto didn't know this, for he began barking angrily and tried to bite the captain's hairy leg, where it showed between, uh, between his red boots and his yellow pantaloons. I like how nobody has asked the shaggy man what his name is. Stop, Toto, cried the little girl, seizing the dog in her arms. These are our friends. Why, so we are, remarked the captain in tones of astonishment. I thought at first that we were enemies, but it seems you are friends indeed. You must come with me to see King Dox. Who's he? asked Button Bright with earnest eyes. King Dox of Foxville, the great and wise sovereign who rules over our community. What's sovereign and what's a community? inquired Button Bright. Don't ask so many questions, little boy. Why? Ah, why indeed, exclaimed the captain, looking at Button Bright admiringly. If you didn't ask questions, you will learn nothing. True enough. I was wrong. You're a very clever little boy, come to think of it. Very clever indeed. But now, friends, please come with me, for it is my duty to escort you at once to the royal palace. The soldiers marched back through the arch again, and with them marched the shaggy man, Dorothy, Toto, and Button Bright. Once through the opening, they found a fine, big city spread out before them, all the houses of carved marble in beautiful colors. The decorations were mostly birds and other fowl, such as peacocks, pheasants, turkeys, prairie chickens, ducks, and geese. Over each doorway was carved a head representing the fox who lived in that house, this effect being quite pretty and unusual. As our friends marched along, some of the foxes came out on the porches and balconies to get a view of the strangers. These foxes were all handsomely dressed, the, fox, uh, the girl foxes and women foxes wearing gowns of feathers woven together effectively and colored in bright hues which Dorothy thought were quite artistic and decidedly attractive. Button Bright stared until his eyes were big and round, and he would have stumbled and fallen more than once had not the shaggy man grasped his hand tightly. They were all interested, and Toady was, uh, Toto was so excited he wanted to bark every minute and to chase and fight every fox he caught sight of. But Dorothy held his little wiggling body fast in her arms and commanded him to be good and behave himself. So he finally quieted down like a wise doggie, deciding there were too many foxes in Foxville to fight at one time. By and by they came to a big square, and in the center of the square stood the royal palace. Dorothy knew it at once, because it had over its great door the curved head of a, uh, carved head of a fox, just like the one she had seen on the, the arch, and this fox was the only one who wore a golden crown. There were many fox soldiers guarding the door, but they bowed to the captain and admitted him without question. The captain led them through many rooms, where richly dressed foxes were sitting on beautiful chairs and sipping tea, which was being passed around by fox servants in white aprons. They came to a big doorway, covered with heavy curtains of cloth or gold. Beside this doorway stood a huge drum, the fox captain went to this drum and knocked his knees against it, first one knee and then the other, so that the drum said, Boom, boom. You must all do exactly what I do, ordered the captain. So the shaggy man pounded the drum with his knees, and so did Dorothy, and so did Button Bright. The boy wa uh, wanted to keep on pounding it with his little fat knees, because he liked the sound of it, but the captain stopped him. Toto couldn't pound the drum with his knees, and he didn't know enough to wag his tail against it. So Dorothy pounded the drum for him, and that made him bark. And when the little dog barked, the fox captain scowled. The golden curtains drew back far enough to make an opening, through which marched the captain with, a, with the others. The broad, long room they entered was decorated in gold with stained glass windows of splendid colors. In the corner of the room, upon a richly carved golden throne, sat the fox king, surrounded by a group of other foxes, all of whom wore great spectacles over their eyes, making them look solemn and important. 
Dorothy knew the king at once because she had seen his head carved on the arch and over the doorway of the palace. Having went with several other kings in her travels, she knew what to do and at once made a low bow before the throne. The shaggy man bowed too and Button Bright bobbed his head and said, Hello. Most wise and noble portentate of Foxville, said the captain, addressing the king in a pompous voice. I humbly beg to report that I found these strangers on the road leading them, uh, leading to your foxy majesty's dominions, and have therefore brought them before you, as is my duty. So, hmm, so, said the king, looking at them keenly, what brought you here, strangers? Our legs may it please your royal highness, uh, royal hairiness, replied the shaggy man. What is your business here, was the next question. To get away as soon as possible, said the shaggy man. The king didn't know about the magnet, of course, but it made him love the shaggy man at once. Do just as you please about going away, said he. But I'd like to show you the sights of my city and to entertain your party while you are here. We feel highly honored to have little Dorothy with us, I assure you, and we appreciate her kindness in making us a visit. For whatever co country Dorothy visits is sure to become famous. This speech greatly surprised the little girl who asked, How did your majesty know my name? Why, everyone knows you, my dear, said the fox king. Don't you realize that? You are quite an important personage since Princess Ozma of Oz made you her friend. Do you know Ozma? she asked, wondering. I regret to say that I do not, he answered sadly. But I hope to meet her soon. You know the Princess Ozma is to celebrate her birthday on the 21st of uh, this month. Is she? said Dorothy. I didn't know that. Yes, it is to be the most brilliant royal ceremony ever held in any city in Fairyland, and I hope you will try to get me an invitation. Dorothy thought a moment. I'm sure Ozma would invite you if I asked her, she said. But how could you get to the land of Oz in the Emerald City? Isn't it a good way from Kansas? Kansas, he exclaimed, surprised. Why, yes, we are in Kansas now, aren't we? She returned. What a queer notion, cried the Fox King, beginning to laugh. Whatever made you think this is Kansas? I left Uncle Henry's farm only about two hours ago. That's the reason, she said, rather perplexed. But tell me, my dear, did you ever see so wonderful a city as Foxville in Kansas? He questioned. No, your majesty. And haven't you traveled from Oz to Kansas in less than half a jiffy? By means of the silver shoes and the magic belt. Oh, sorry about that sound there. There we go, that's out of the way. Uh, by means of the silver shoe and the magic belt? Yes, your majesty, she acknowledged. Then why do you wonder that an hour or two could bring you to Foxville, which is nearer to Oz than it is to Kansas? Dear me, exclaimed Dorothy, is this another fairy adventure? It seems to be, said the Fox King, smiling. Dorothy turned to the shaggy man, and her vo face was grave and reproachful. Are you a magician or a fairy in disguise, she asked. Did you enchant me when you asked the way to Butterfield? The shaggy man shook his head. Never heard of a shaggy fairy, he replied. No, Dorothy, my dear. I'm not to blame for this journey in any way, I assure you. There's been something strange about me ever since I owned the love magnet, but I don't know what it is in any more than you do. I didn't try to get away from home at all. If you want to find your way back to the farm, I'll go with you willingly and do my best to help you. Never mind, said the little girl thoughtfully. There isn't so much to see in Kansas as there is here, and I guess Aunt Em won't be very much worried. That is, if I don't stay away too long. That's right, declared the Fox King, nodding approval. Be contented with your lot, whatever it happens to be, if you are wise. Which reminds me that you have a new companion on this adventure. He looks very clever and bright. He is, said Dorothy, and the shaggy man nodded. That's his name, your royal foxiness, Button Bright.
and just redeeming my own hydration. Chapter 4, King Ducks. It was amusing to note the expression on the face of King Ducks as he looked over the boy, from his sailor hat to his stubby shoes, and it was equally diverting to watch Button Bright stare at the king in return. No fox ever beheld a fresher, fairer child's face, and no child had ever before heard a fox talk or met with one who dressed so handsomely and ruled so big a city. I am sorry to say that no one had ever told the little boy much about fairies of any kind. This being the case, it is so easy to understand how much this strange experience startled and astonished him. How do you like us? asked the king. Don't know, said Button Bright. Of course you don't. It's too short an acquaintance, returned his majesty. Why do you suppose, what do you suppose my name is? Don't know, said Button Bright. How should you? Well, I'll tell you. My private name is Docs, but a king can't be called by his private name. He has to take one that is official. Therefore, my official name is King Renard the Fourth. Renard, with the accent on the Ren. What's Ren? asked Button Bright. How clever! exclaimed the king, turning a pleased face towards his counselors. This boy is indeed remarkably bright. What's Wren, he asks, and of course Wren is nothing at all, all by itself. Yes, he's very bright indeed. I think that Renard is, um, fox in French. That question is what your majesty might call foxy, said one of the counselors, an old gray fox. So it is, declared the king. Turning again to Button Bright, he said, Having told you my name, what would you call me? King Dots said the boy. Why? Because Wren's nothing at all, was the reply. Good, very good indeed. You certainly have a brilliant mind. Do you know why two and two make four? No, said Button Bright. Clever, clever indeed. Of course you don't know. Nobody knows why. We only know it's so, and can't tell why it's so. Button Bright, these curls and blue eyes do not go well with such uh, with so much wisdom. Why, uh, they make you look too youthful and hide your real cleverness. Therefore, I will do you a great favor. I will confer upon you the head of a fox, so that you may hereafter look as bright as you really are. As he spoke, the king pawed, uh, waved his paw toward the boy, and at once the pretty curls and fresh round face and big blue eyes were gone, while in their place a fox's head appeared upon Button Bright's shoulders. A, fair, a hairy head with a sharp nose, pointed ears, and keen little eyes. Oh, don't do that, cried Dorothy, shrinking back from her transformed companion with a shocked and dismayed face. Too late, my dear, it's done. But you also shall have a fox's head if you can prove you're as clever as Button Bright. I don't want it! It's dreadful! she exclaimed. And hearing this verdict, Button Bright began to boo-hoo just as if he were still a little boy. How can you t call that lovely head dreadful? asked the king. It's a much prettier face than he had before, to my notion, and my wife says I'm a good judge of beauty. Don't cry, little fox boy. Laugh and be proud, because you are so highly favored. How do you like the new head, Button Bright? Don't know, sobbed the child. Please, please change him back again, your majesty, begged Dorothy. King Renard the Fourth shook his head. I can't do that, he said. I haven't the power, even if I wanted to. No, Button Bright must wear his fox head, and he'll be sure to love it dearly as soon as he gets used to it. Both the shaggy man and Dorothy looked grave and anxious, for they were sorrowful that such a misfortune had overtaken their little companion. Toto barked at the fox boy once or twice, not realizing it was his former friend who now wore the, fo the animal's head, but Dorothy cuffed the dog and made him stop. As for the foxes, they all seemed to think Button Bright's new head very becoming, and that their king had conferred a great honor on this little stranger. It was funny to see the boy reach up to feel his sharp nose and wide mouth, and wail afresh with grief. He wagged his ears in a comical manner, and tears were in his little black eyes. 
but Dorothy couldn't laugh at her friend just yet because she felt so sorry. Just then, three little fox princesses, daughters of the king, entered the room, and when they saw Button Bright, one exclaimed, How lovely he is! And the next one cried in delight, How sweet he is! And the third princess clapped her hands with pleasure and said, How beautiful he is! Button Bright stopped crying and asked timidly, Am I? In all the world there is not another face so pretty declared the biggest fox princess. You must live with us always and be our brother, said the next. We shall all love you dearly, the third said. This praise did not uh, did much to comfort the boy, and he looked around and tried to smile. It was a pitiful attempt, because the fox face was new and stiff, and Dorothy thought his expression more stupid than before the transformation. I think we ought to be going now, said the shaggy man uneasily, for he didn't know what the king might take into his head to do next. Don't leave us yet, I beg of you, pleaded King Renard. I intend to have several days of feasting and merrymaking in honor of your visit. Have it after we're gone, for we can't wait, said Dorothy decidedly, but seeing this displeased the king, she added, if I'm going to get Ozma to invite you to her party, I'll have to find her as soon as possible, you know. In spite of all the beauty of Foxville and the gorgeous dresses of its inhabitants, both the girl and the shaggy men felt that they were not quite safe there and would be glad to see the last of it. But it is now evening, the king reminded them, and you must stay with us until morning anyhow. Therefore, I invite you to be my guests at dinner, and to attend the theater hereafter, and sit in the royal box. Tomorrow morning, if you really insist upon it, you may resume your journey. They contest, uh, consented to this, and some of the fox servants led them to a, su a suite of lovely rooms in the big palace. Button Bright was afraid to be left alone, so Dorothy took him into her own room. While a maid fox dressed the little girl's hair, which was a bit tangled, and put some bright fresh ribbons in it, another fox maid combed the hair on poor Button Bright's face and head and brushed it carefully, trying, uh, tying, a tink, uh, sorry, tying a pink bow to each of his pointed ears. The maids wanted to dress the children in fine costumes of woven features, such as all the foxes wore, but neither of them consented to that. A sailor suit and a fox head do not go well together, said one of the maids, for no fox was ever a sailor that I can remember. I'm not a fox, cried Button Bright. Alas, no, agreed the maid, but you've got a lovely fox head on your skinny shoulders, and that's almost as good as being a fox. The boy, reminded of this misfortune, began to cry again. Dorothy petted and comforted him, and promised to find some way to restore him his own head. If we can manage to get to Ozma, she said, the princess will change you back to yourself in half a second. So you just wear that fox head on as comfortably as you can, dear, and don't worry about it at all. It is nearly as pretty as your own head, no matter what the foxes say, but you can get along with it for a little while longer, can't you? Don't know said Button Bright doubtfully, but he didn't cry any more than that. Dorothy let the maids pin ribbons to her shoulders. Ah, uh, huh, that's interesting. Ribbons to her shoulders. Dorothy let the maids pin ribbons to her shoulders, after which they were ready for the king's dinner. When they met uh, the shaggy man in his splendid drawing room of the palace, they found him just the same as before. He had refused to give up his shaggy clothes for new ones, because if he did that, he would no longer be the shaggy man, he said, and he might have to get acquainted with himself all over again. He do told Dorothy he had brushed his shaggy hair and whiskers, but she thought he must have brushed them the wrong way, for they were quite as shaggy as before. As for the company of foxes assembled to dine with the strangers, they were most beautifully costumed, and their rich dresses made Dorothy's simple gown and Button Bright's sailor suit and the shaggy man's shaggy clothing look commonplace. But they treated their guests with much respect, and the king's dinner was a very good dinner indeed. 
foxes, as you know, are fond of chicken and other fowl, so they serve chicken soup and roasted turkey and stewed duck and fried grouse and broil, uh, broiled quail and goose pie. And as the cooking was excellent, the king's guests enjoyed the meal and ate heartily of the various dish, uh, dishes. The party went to the theater where they saw a play acted by foxes dressed in costumes of brilliantly colored feathers. The play was about a fox girl who was stolen by some wicked wolves and carried to their cave. And just as they were about to kill her and eat her, a company of fox soldiers marched up, saved the girl, and put all the wicked wolves to death. How do you like it? the king asked Dorothy. Pretty well, she answered. It reminds me of one of the Mr. Aesop's fables. Don't mention Aesop to me, I beg you, exclaimed King Dox. I hate that man's name. He wrote a good deal about foxes, but always made them out cruel and wicked, whereas we are gentle and kind, as you may see. But his fables showed you to be wise and clever, and more shrewd than other animals, said the shaggy man thoughtfully. So we are. There is no question about our knowing more than men do, replied the king proudly. But we employ our wisdom to do good instead of harm, so that horrid Aesop did not know what he was talking about. They did not like to contradict him, because they felt he ought to know the nature of foxes better than men did. So they sat still and watched the play, and Button Bright became so interested that for the time he forgot he wore a fox's head. Afterward they went back to the palace and slept in soft beds stuffed with feathers, for the foxes raised many fowl for food, and used their feathers for clothing and to sleep upon. Dorothy wondered why the animals lived in Foxville, uh, living in Foxville did not wear just their own hairy skins as wild foxes do. When she mentioned it to the King Docks, he said they clothed themselves because they were civilized. But you were born without clothes, she observed, and you don't seem to me to need them. So were human beings born without clothes, he replied. And until they became civilized, they wore only their natural skins. But to become civilized means to dress as elaborately and prettily as possible and to make a show of your clothes so your neighbors will envy you. And for that reason, both civilized foxes and civilized humans spend most of their time dressing themselves. I don't, declared the shaggy man. That is true, said the king, looking at him carefully, but perhaps you are not civilized. After a sound sleep and a good night's rest, they had their breakfast with the king and then bade his majesty goodbye. You've been kind to us, except poor Button Bright, said Dorothy, and we've had a nice time in Foxville. Then, said King Dox, perhaps you'll be good enough to get me an invitation to Princess Ozma's birthday celebration. I'll try, she promised if I see her in time. It's on the 21st, remember, he continued, and if you'll just see that I'm invited, I'll find a way to cross the dreadful desert into the marvelous land of Oz. I've always wanted to visit the Emerald City, so I'm sure it was fortunate you answered, uh, arrived here just when you did, you being Princess Ozma's friend and able to assist me in getting the invitation. If I see Ozma, I'll ask her to invite you, she replied. The Fox King had a delightful luncheon put up for them, which the shaggy man shoved in his pocket, and the fox captain escorted them to an arch at the side of the village opposite the one by which they had entered. Here they found more soldiers guarding the road. "'Are you afraid of enemies?' asked Dorothy. "'No, because we are watchful and able to protect ourselves,' answered the captain." But this road leads to another village peopled by big, stupid beasts who might cause us trouble if they thought we were afraid of them. What beasts are they? asked the shaggy man. The captain hesitated to answer. Finally, he said, You will learn all about them when you arrive at their city, but do not be afraid of them. Button Bright is so wonderfully clever and has now such an intelligent face that I'm sure he will manage to find a way to protect you. This made Dorothy and the Shaggy Man rather uneasy, for they had not so much confidence in the little boy's wisdom at the, as the captain seemed to have. But as their escort would say no more about the beasts, they bade him goodbye and proceeded on their journey. Chapter 2 
Chapter 5, The Rainbow's Daughter Toto, now allowed to run about as he pleased, was glad to be free again and able to bark at the birds and chase the butterflies. The country around them was charming, yet in the pretty field of wild flowers and groves of leafy trees were no houses whatsoever or signs of any inhabitants. Birds flew through the air, and cunning white rabbits darted amongst the tall grasses and green bushes. Dorothy noticed even the ants toiling busily along the roadway, bearing gigantic loaves of clover seeds. But of people there were none at all. They walked briskly on for an hour or two, for even little Button Bright was a good walker and did not tire easily. At length, they returned. Uh, they turned a curve in the road. They beheld just before them a curious sight. A little girl, radiant and beautiful, shapely as a fairy and exquisitely dressed, was dancing gracefully in the middle of the lonely road, whirling slowly this way and that, her dainty feet twinkling in sprightly fashion. She was clad in flowing, fluffy robes of soft material that reminded Dorothy of woven cobwebs, only it was colored in soft tintings of violet, rose, topaz, olive, azure, and white, mingling together most harmoniously in stripes which melted one into the other with soft blendings. Her hair was like spun gold and flowed around her in a cloud, no strand being fastened or confined by, other, uh, by either pin or ornament or ribbon. Filled with wonder and admiration, our friends approached and stood watching this fascinating dance. The girl was no taller than Dorothy, although more slender, nor did she seem any older than our little heroine. Suddenly, she paused and abandoned the dance, as if for the first time observing the presence of strangers. As she faced them, shy as a frightened fawn, Poised upon one foot as if to fly the next instant, Dorothy was astonished to see fle tears flowing from her violet eyes and trickling down her lovely rose-hued cheeks. That the dainty maiden should dance and weep at the same time was indeed surprising, so Dorothy asked in a soft, sympathetic voice, Are you unhappy, little girl? Very, was the reply. I'm lost. Why, so are we, said Dorothy, smiling, but we didn't cry about it. Don't you? Why not? Because I've been lost before and always found, uh, got found again, answered Dorothy simply. But I've never been lost before, murmured the dainty maiden, and I'm worried and afraid. You were dancing, remarked Dorothy in a puzzled tone of voice. Oh, that was just to keep warm, explained the maiden quickly. It was not because I felt happy or gay, I assure you. Dorothy looked at her closely. Uh, closely, Her gauzy flowing robes might not be very warm, yet the weather wasn't at all chilly, but rather mild and balmy, like a spring day. "'Who are you, dear?' she asked gently. "'I'm Polychrome,' was the reply. "'Polly whom?' "'Polychrome. I'm the daughter of the rainbow.' "'Oh,' said Dorothy with a gasp. "'I didn't know the rainbow had children, but I might have known it before you spoke.' You couldn't really be anything else. Why not? inquired Polychrome as if surprised. Because you're so lovely and sweet. The little ma maiden smiled through her tears, came up to Dorothy, and placed her slender fingers in the Kansas girl's chubby hand. You'll be my friend, won't you? she asked pleadingly. Of course. And what is your name? I'm Dorothy, and this is my friend Shaggy Man, who owns the Love Magnet, and this is Button Bright, only you don't see him as he really is because the Fox King carelessly changed his head into a fox head. But the real Button Bright is good to look at, and I hope to get him changed back to himself sometime. The Rainbow's daughter nodded carefully, no longer afraid of her new companions. But who is this? she asked, pointing to Toto, who was sitting before her, wagging his tail in the most friendly manner and admiring the pretty maid with his bright eyes. Is this also some enchanted person? Oh no, Polly. I may call you Polly, mayn't I? Your whole name's awful hard to say. Call me Polly if you wish, Dorothy. Well, Polly, Toto's just a dog, but he has more sense than Button Bright to tell the truth, and I'm very fond of him. So am I, said Polychrome, 
blending gracefully to pat, uh, bending gracefully to pat Toto's head. But how did the rainbow's daughter ever get on this lonely road and become lost? asked the shaggy man, who had listened wonderingly at all this. Why, my father stretched his rainbow over here this morning so that one end of it might touch the road, was the reply, and I was dancing upon the pretty rays as I loved to do, and never noticed I was getting too far over the bend in the circle. Suddenly I began to slide, and I went faster and faster until at last I bumped on the ground at the very end. Just then father lifted the rainbow again, without noticing me at all, and though I tried to seize the end of it and hold fast, it melted away entirely, and I was left alone and helpless on the cold, hard earth. It doesn't seem cold to me, Polly, said Dorothy. But perhaps you're not warmly dressed. I'm so used to living nearby the sun, replied the rainbow's daughter, that at first I feared I would freeze down here. But my dance has warmed me some, and now I wonder how I am ever to get home again. Won't your father miss you and look for you and let down another rainbow for you? Perhaps so, but he's busy just now because it rains in so many parts of the world at this season, and he has to set his rainbow in a lot of different places. Why would you advise, what would you advise me to do, Dorothy? Come with us, was the answer. I'm going to try to find my way to the Emerald City, which is in the la fairyland of Oz. The Emerald City is ruled by a friend of mine, the Princess Ozma, and if she can manage to get there, uh, oh, and if we can manage to get there, I'm sure she will know a way to send you home to your father again. Do you really think so? asked Polychrome anxiously. I'm pretty sure. Then I'll go with you, said the little maid, for travel will help keep me warm, and father can find me in one part of the world as well as another, if he gets time to look for me. Come along then, said the shaggy man cheerfully, and they started on once more. Polly walked beside Dorothy a while, holding her new friend's hand as if she feared to let it go, but her nature seemed as bright and buoyant as her fleecy robes, for suddenly she darted ahead and whirled round in a giddy dance. Then she tripped back to them with sparkling eyes and smiling cheeks, having regained her usual happy mood and forgotten all her worry about being lost. They found her a charming companion in her dancing and laughter, for she laughed at times like the tinkling of a silver bell, did much to enliven their journey and keep them contented. It's interesting that um, Toto never speaks in any of these books. I think he is the only animal who does not speak in any of the fairy lands which is not very consistent with the rest of the, uh, you know, the creatures. I wonder if they'll ever explain that, or if they think to. Chapter 6, The City of Beasts When noon came, they opened the Fox King's basket of luncheon and found a nice roasted turkey with cranberry sauce and some slices of bread and butter. As they sat on the grass by the roadside, the shaggy man cut up the turkey with his pocket knife and passed slices of it around. "'Haven't you any dew drops or mist cakes or cloud buns?' asked Polychrome longingly. "'Of course not,' replied Dorothy. "'We eat solid things down here on the earth. If there's a bottle of cold tea, try some, won't you?' The rainbow's daughter watched Button Bright devour one leg of turkey. "'Is it good?' she asked. He nodded. Do you think I could eat it? Not this, said Button Bright, but I mean another piece. Don't know, he replied. Well, I'm going to try, for I'm very hungry, she decided, and took a thin slice of the white breast of turkey, while the shaggy man cut her, uh, cut, which the shaggy man cut for her, as well as a bit of bread and butter. When she tasted it, Polychrome thought the turkey was good, but even uh, better even than mist cakes. But a little satisfied her hunger, uh, but a little satisfied her hunger, and she finished with a tiny sip of cold tea. That's about a, as much as a fly would eat, said Dorothy, who was making a good meal herself. But I know some people in Oz who eat nothing at all. Who are they? inquired the shaggy man. What is a scarecrow who's stuffed with straw and the other a woodman uh, made out of tin? 
They haven't any appetites inside of them, you see, so they can never eat anything at all. Are they alive? asked Button Bright. Oh, yes, replied Dorothy, and they're very clever and very nice, too. If we get to Oz, I'll introduce them to you. Do you really expect to get to Oz? inquired the shaggy man, taking a drink of cold tea. I don't know just what to expect, answered the child seriously. But I've noticed if I happen to get lost, I'm almost sure to come to the land of Oz in the end, somehow or other, so I may get there this time. But I can't promise, you know. All I can do is wait and see. Will the scarecrow scare me? asked Button Bright. No, because you're not a crow, she replied. He has the loveliest smile you ever saw, only it's painted on and he can't help it. Luncheon being over, they started again upon their journey, the shaggy man Dorothy and Button Bright walking somberly, uh, soberly along side by side, and the rainbow's daughter dancing merrily before them. Sometimes she darted along the road so swiftly that she was nearly out of sight. Then she came tripping back to greet them with her silvery laughter. But once she came back more sedately to say, There's a city a little way off. Expected that, returned Dorothy, but the fox people warned us that there was one in, on this road. It's filled with stupid beasts of some sort, but we mustn't be afraid of them because they won't hurt us. All right, said Button Bright, but Polychrome didn't know whether it was all right or not. It's a big city, she said, and the road runs straight through it. Never mind, said the shaggy man. As long as I carry the love magnet, every living thing will love me, and you may be sure I shan't allow any of my friends to be harmed in any way. This comforted them somewhat, and they moved on again. Pretty soon they came to a signpost that read, Half a mile to Dunkerton. And I'm going to spell that out to you, uh, for you because it is severely misspelled. So that is how it appears. Oh, said the shaggy man. They're donkeys. We've nothing to fear at all. They may kick, said Dorothy doubtfully. Then we will cut some uh, switches and make them behave, he replied. At the first tree, he cut himself a long, slender switch from one of the branches and shorter switches for the others. Don't be afraid to order the beasts around, he said. They're used to it. Before long, the road brought them to the gates of the city. There was a high wall all around, which had been whitewashed, and the gate just before our travelers was a mere opening in the wall with no bars across it. No towers or steeples or domes showed above the enclosure, nor was any living thing to be seen as our friends drew near. Suddenly, as they were about to boldly enter through the opening, there arose a harsh clamor of sounds that swelled and echoed on every side, until they were nearly deafened by the racket and had to put their fingers to their ears to keep the noise out. It was like the firing of many cannon, only there was no cannonballs or other missiles to be seen. It was like the rolling of mighty thunder, only not a cloud was in the sky. It was like the roar of countless breakers on a rugged seashore, only there was no sea or other water anywhere about. They hesitated to advance, but as the noise did no harm, they entered through the whitewashed wall and quickly discovered the cause of the turmoil. Inside were suspended many sheets of tin or thin iron, and against these metal sheets a row of donkeys were pounding their heels with vicious kicks. The shaggy man ran up to the nearest donkey and gave the beast a sharp blow with his switch. Stop that noise, he shouted, and the donkey stopped kicking the metal sheet and turned its head to look with surprise at the shaggy man. He switched the next donkey and made him stop, and then the next, so that gradually the rattling of heels ceased and the awful noise subsided. The donkey stood in a group and eyed the strangers with fear and trembling. "'What do you mean by making such a racket?' answered the shaggy man sternly. "'We were scaring away the foxes,' said one of the donkeys, meekly. "'Usually they run fast enough when they hear this noise which makes them afraid.' "'There are no foxes here,' said the shaggy man. 
I beg to differ with you. There's one anyhow, replied the donkey, sitting upright on his haunches and waving a hoof toward Button Bright. We saw him coming and thought the whole army of foxes was marching to attack us. Button Bright isn't a fox, replied the shaggy man. He's only wearing a fox head for a time until we, he can get his own head back. Oh, I see, remarked the donkey, waving his left ear reflectively. I'm sorry we made such a mistake and had all our work and worry for nothing. The other donkeys by this time were sitting up and examining the strangers with big glassy eyes. They made a queer picture indeed, for they wore t wide white collars around their necks, and the collars had many scallops and points. The gentlemen donkeys wore high pointed caps set between their great ears, and the lady donkeys wore sunbonnets with holes cut in the top for the ears to stick through. But they had no other clothing except their hairy skins, although many wore gold and silver bangles on their front wrists and bands of different metals on their rear ankles. When they were kicking, they had braced themselves with their front legs, but now they all stood or sat upright on their hind legs and used their front ones as arms. Having no fingers or hands, the beasts were rather clumsy, as you may guess, but Dorothy was surprised to dis observe how many things they could do with their stiff, heavy hooves. Some of the donkeys were white. Some were brown, or gray, or black, or spotted, but their hair was sleek and smooth, and their broad collars and caps gave them a neat, if whimsical, appearance. This is a nice way to welcome visitors, I must say, remarked the shaggy man in a reproachful tone. Oh, we did not mean to be impolite, replied the gray donkey, which he had not spoken before. But you were not expected, nor did you send in your visiting cards as if it, as it is proper to do. There is some truth in that, admitted the shaggy man. But now you are informed that we are important and distinguished travelers, I trust you will accord us proper consideration. These big words delighted the donkeys and made them bow to the shaggy man with great respect, said the gray one. You shall be taken before his great and glorious majesty, King Kikabere, who will greet you as becomes you the, uh, your exalted station. That's right, answered Dorothy. Take us to someone who knows something. Oh, we all know something, my child, or we wouldn't be donkeys, asserted the gray one with dignity. The word donkey means clever, you know. I didn't know that, she replied. I thought it meant stupid. Not at all, my child. If you will look in the encyclopedia Doncaniara, uh, you will find him. I'm correct. But come, I will myself lead you before your sp our splendid, exalted, and most intellectual ruler. All donkeys love big words, so it is no wonder the gray one used so many of them. I love that they use all these big words, but they cannot spell, as you can see from uh, the thing that I typed in chat. Just taking a tiny hydration uh, break. Oh, wow, what? <laughs> the, uh, the thing that I typed in chat or the story. These are strange stories. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they are. Oh, yes. Uh, I had to put that in there. I apologize to the people who will be watching on YouTube uh, that they can't see the uh, spelling, but it is quite something. By the way, Regent, um, I don't know if I had mentioned this before, but all of my um, my story times I put up on YouTube, though as an affiliate, um, the agreement with Twitch is that they get exclusive rights to the stream for 24 hours, so I will be waiting 24 hours uh, before I export all uh, the story times from now on onto YouTube, but... Um, Let's see, do I have the, let me see if I do. 
And if I don't, oh, oh, hey, good. I do have that command. So that is uh, the link to the playlists, and I have them in the playlist so you don't have to go searching for the next uh, video for, you know, the next story time and all that stuff. So, yeah. Which I need to remember after, um, of course, after story time, I'm going to do a game stream today. But after that, I need to put up yesterday's story time on YouTube. All right, continuing. Chapter 7. The Shaggy Man's Transformation. Ooh, fancy. I can't wait to see this. They found the houses of the town all low and square and built of bricks, neatly whitewashed inside and out. The houses were not set in rows, forming regular streets, but placed here and there in a haphazard manner which made it puzzling for a stranger to find his way. Stupid people must have streets and numbered houses in their cities to guide them where to go, observed the grave donkey, as he walked before the visitors on his hind legs in an awkward but comical manner. The clever donkeys know their way about without such absurd marks. Moreover, a mixed city is much prettier than one with straight streets. Dorothy did not agree with this, but she said nothing to contradict it. Presently, she saw a sign on a house that read, Madame de Fake's Hoofist. Uh, Madame de Fake, Hoofist. And she asked her conductor, What's a hoofist, please? One who reads your fortune in your hooves, replied the gray donkey. Oh, I see, said the little girl. You are quite civilized here. Dunkerton, he replied, is the center of the whole world, uh, the world's highest civilization. They came to a house where two youthful donkeys were whitewashing the walls, and Dorothy stopped a moment to watch them. They dipped the ends of their tails, which were much like paintbrushes, into a t pail of whitewash, backed up against the house, and wagged their tails right and left until the whitewash, uh was rubbed on the walls, after which they dipped these funny brushes in the pail again and repeated the performance. That must be fun, said Button Bright. No, it's work, replied the old donkey, but we make our youngsters do all the whitewashing to keep them out of mischief. Don't they go to school? asked Dorothy. All donkeys are born wise, was the reply. So the only school we need is the school of experience. Books are only for those who know nothing and so are obliged to learn things from other people. In other words, the more stupid one is, the more he thinks he knows, observed the shaggy man. The gray donkey paid no attention to this speech because he had just stopped before a house which had painted, uh, which had painted over the doorway a pair of hoofs with a donkey tail between them and a rude crown and scepter above. I'll see if his magnificent majesty King Kickabray is at home, said he. He lifted his head and called, Wee-haw! 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 Three times in a shocking voice, turning about and kicking with his heels against the panel of the door. For a time there was no reply. Then the door opened far enough to permit a donkey's head to stick out and look at them. It was a white head with big, awful ears and round, solemn eyes. Have the foxes gone? it asked in a trembling voice. They haven't been here, most stupendous majesty, replied the gray one. The new arrivals proved to be travelers of distinction. Oh, said the king in a relieved tone of voice, let them come in. He opened the door wide and the party marched into a big room, which Dorothy thought looked quite unlike a king's palace. There were mats of woven grasses on the floor, and the place was clean and neat, but His Majesty had no other furniture at all, perhaps because he didn't need it. He squatted down in the center of the room, and a big brown donkey ran and brought a big gold crown which it placed on the monarch's head, and a golden staff with a jeweled ball at the end of it, which the king held between his front hooves as he sat upright. <coughs> Now then, said his majesty, waving his long ears gently to and fro, tell me why you are here and what you expect me to do for you. He eyed Button Bright rather sharply, as if afraid of the little boy's queer head, though it was the shaggy man who undertook to reply. Most noble and supreme ruler of Dunkerton, he said, trying not to laugh at the solemn king's face, 
We are strangers traveling through your dominions and have entered your magnificent city because the road lead, uh, led through it, and there is no way to go around. All we desire is to pay our respects to your majesty, the cleverest king in all the world, I'm sure, and then to continue on our way. This polite speech pleased the king very much. Indeed, it pleased him so much that it proved an unlucky speech for the shaggy man. Perhaps the love magnet helped to win his majesty's affection as well as the flattery, but however this may be, the white donkey looked kindly upon the speaker and said, Only a donkey should be able to use such fine, fine, big words, and you are too wise and admirable in all ways to be a mere man. Also, I feel that I love you as well as I do my own favored people, so I will bestow upon you the greatest gift within my power, a donkey's head. As he spoke, he waved his jeweled staff, though the shaggy man, although the shaggy man cried out and tried to leap backward and escape, it proved of no use. Suddenly his own head was gone, and a donkey head appeared in its place, a brown shaggy head so absurd and droll that Dorothy and Polly both broke into merry laughter, and even Button Bright's fox face wore a smile. Dear me, dear me, cried the shaggy man, feeling of his shaggy new head and his long ears. Oh, what a misfortune, what a great misfortune. Give me back my own head, you stupid king, if you love me at all. Don't you like it? asked the king, surprised. <laughs> oh, I hate it. Take it away, quick, said the shaggy man. But I can't do that, was the reply. My magic works only one way. I can do things, but I can't undo them. You'll have to find the truth pond and bathe in its waters in order to get back your own head, but I advise you not to do that. This head is much more beautiful than the old one. That's a matter of taste, said Dorothy. Where is the truth pond? asked the shaggy man earnestly. Somewhere in the land of Oz, but just the exact location, if I cannot tell. Of it, I cannot tell, was the answer. Don't worry, shaggy man, said Dorothy, smiling because her friend wagged his new ears so comically. If the truth pond is in Oz, we will be sure to find it when we get there. Oh, are you going to the land of Oz? asked King Kickabray. I don't know, she replied. But we've been told we are nearer the land of Oz than to Kansas, and if that's so, the quickest way for me to get home is to find Ozma. Hi ya! Do you know the mighty Princess Ozma? asked the king, his tone both surprised and eager. Of course I do, she's my friend, said Dorothy. Then perhaps you'll do me a favor, continued the white donkey, much excited. What is it? she asked. Perhaps you can get me an invitation to Princess Ozma's birthday celebration, which will be the grandest royal function ever held in Fairyland. I'd love to go. Hey, hi, you deserve punishment rather than reward for giving me this dreadful head, said the shaggy man sorrowfully. I wish you wouldn't say he haw so much, Polychrome begged him. It makes cold chills run down my back. But I can't help it, my dear. My donkey head wants to break continually, he replied. Doesn't your fox head want to help, uh, yelp every minute, he asked Button Bright. Dunno, said the boy, still staring at the shaggy man's ears. These seemed to interest him greatly, and the sight also made him forget his own fox head, which was a comfort. What do you think, Polly? Shall I promise the donkey king an invitation to Ozma's party? asked Dorothy of the Rainbow's daughter, who was flitting about the room like a sunbeam because she could not, uh, she could never keep still. Do as you please, dear, answered Polychrome. He might help to amuse the guests, uh, he might help to amuse the guests of the princess. Then if you will give us some supper and a place to sleep tonight, and let us get started on our journey early tomorrow morning, said Dorothy to the king, I'll ask Ozma to invite you. If I happen to get to Oz, good, he ha, excellent! Cried King Abray, King Kickabray, much pleased. You shall all have fine suppers and good beds. What food would you prefer, a bran mash or ripe oats in the shell? Neither one, replied Dorothy promptly. Perhaps plain hay or some sweet, juicy grass would suit you better, suggested Kickabray musingly. Is that all you have to eat? Asked the girl. 
What more do you desire? Well, you see, we're not donkeys, she explained, and so we're used to other food. Foxes gave us a nice supper in Foxville. We'd like some dewdrops and mist cakes, said Polychrome. I prefer apples and a ham sandwich, declared the shaggy man, for although I have a donkey head, I still have my own particular stomach. I want pie, said Button Bright. I think some beefsteak and chocolate layer cake would be would be, uh, taste best, said Dorothy. Ooh, chocolate layer cake sounds so good. Now I want that. He ha I declare, exclaimed the king. Seems each one of you wants a different food. How queer all living creatures are except donkeys. And donkeys like you are the queerest of all, laughed Polychrome. Well, replied the king, I suppose my magic staff will produce the things you crave. If you are lacking in good taste, it is not my fault. With this, he waved his staff with a jeweled ball, and before them instantly appeared a tea table set with linen and pretty dishes, and on the table were the very things each had wished for. Dorothy's beefsteak was smoking hot, and the shaggy man's apples were plump and rosy-cheeked. The king had not thought to provide chairs, so they all stood in their places round the table and ate with good appetite, being hungry. The rainbow's daughter found three tiny dewdrops on a crystal plate, and Button Bright had a big slice of apple pie, which he devoured eagerly. Afterward, the king called the brown donkey, which was his favorite servant, and bade it lead his guests to the vacant house where they were to pass the night. It had only one room and no furniture except beds of clean straw and a few mats of woven grasses. But our travelers were contented with these simple things, because they realized it was the best the donkey king had to offer them. As soon as it was dark, they lay down on the mats and slept comfortably until morning. At daybreak, there was a dreadful noise throughout the city. Every donkey in the place brayed. When he heard this, the shaggy man woke up and called out, Hee-haw! as loud as he could. Stop that, said Button Bright in a cross voice. Both Dorothy and Polly looked at the shaggy man reproachfully. I couldn't help it, my dears, he said as if ashamed of his bray. But I'll try not to do it again. Of course they forgave him, but as he still had the love magnet in his pocket, they were all obliged to love him as much as ever. They did not see the king again, because Kickabray remembered them, for a table appeared again in their... Uh, but King Kickabray remembered them, for a table appeared again in their room with the same food upon it as on the night before. Don't want pie for breakfast, said Button Bright. I'll give you some of my beef cake, proposed Dorothy. Beef steak. There's plenty for all of us. That suited the boy better, but the shaggy man said he was content with his apple and sandwiches, which, uh, although he ended the meal by eating Button Bright's pie. Polly liked her dewdrops and mist cakes better than any other food, so they all enjoyed their excellent breakfast. Toto had the scraps left from the beefsteak, and he stood up nicely on his hind paws while Dorothy fed them to him. Breakfast ended. They passed through the village to the side opposite that by which they had entered. The brown servant donkey guided them through the maze of scattered houses. There was the road again, leading far away into the unknown country beyond. King Gekabray says ye, you must not forget his invitation, said the brown donkey as they passed through the opening in the wall. I shan't, promised Dorothy. Perhaps no one ever beheld a more strangely assorted group than the one which now walked along the road, though pretty green, uh, through pretty green fields and past groves of feathery pepper trees and fragrant mimosa. Polychrome, or her beautiful gauzy robes floating around her like a rainbow cloud, went first, dancing back and forth and darting now here and to pluck a wild flower or there to watch a beetle crawl across the path. Toto ran after her at times, barking joyously the while, only to become sober again and trot along at Dorothy's heels. The little Kansas girl walked holding Button Bright's hand, clasped in her own, and the wee boy with his fox head covered by the sailor's hat presented an odd appearance. Strangest of all, perhaps, was the shaggy man with his shaggy donkey head who shuffled along in the rear with his hands thrust deep in his big pockets. None of the party was really unhappy. All were staying in an unknown land and had suffered more or less annoyances, uh, 
more or less annoyance and discomfort, but they realized they were having a fairy adventure in a fairy country and were much interested in finding out what would happen next. Chapter 8. The Musiker About the middle of the forenoon, they began to go up a long hill. By and by, this hill suddenly dropped down into a pretty valley where the travelers sat, uh, saw, to their surprise, a small house standing by the roadside. It was the first house they had seen, and they hesitated, uh, hastened into the valley to discover who lived there. No one was in sight as they approached, but when they began to get nearer the house, they heard queer noises coming from it. They could not make these out at first, but as they became louder, our friends thought they heard a, so a sort of music like that made by a wheezy hand organ. The music fell upon their ears in this way. Uh, tittle whittle ittle, pom pom pom, om pom pom, om pom pom, tittle little tittle, om um, pom pom. Um, pom, pom, pa. What is that, a band or a mouth organ? asked Dorothy. Don't know, said Button Bright. Sounds to me like a play out, uh, played out phonograph, said the shaggy man, lifting his enormous ears to listen. Oh, there just couldn't be a funny graph in fairyland, cried Dorothy. It's rather pretty, isn't it? asked Polychrome, trying to dance to the strains. Tiddle, whittle, whittle. Um, pom, pom. Um, pom, pom. Um, pom, pom. Came the music to their ears more distinctly as they drew nearer the house. Presently, they saw a fat little man sitting on a bench before the door. He wore a red braided jacket to, that reached to his waist, a blue waistcoat, and white trousers with gold stripes down the sides. On his bald head was perched a little round red cap held in place by a rudder elastic, uh, by a rubber elastic underneath his chin. His face was round, his eyes a faded blue, and he wore a white cotton and he wore white cotton gloves. The man leaned on a stout gold headed cane, bending forward on his seat to watch his visitors approach. Singularly enough, the music sounded uh, sounds as if they heard some <laughs> Singularly enough, the music sounds they had heard seemed to come from the inside of the fat man himself, for he was playing no instrument, nor was any to be seen near him. They came up and stood in a row, staring at him. He stared back while the queer sounds came from him as before. Tiddle little little, um pom pom, um pom pom, um pom pom, tiddle little little, um pom pom, um pom pom. Why, he's a regular musicker, said Button Bright. What's a musicker? asked Dorothy. Him, said the boy. Hearing this, the fat man sat up a little stiffer than before, as if he had received a compliment, and still came the sounds, tiddle little little um pom pom um pom pom um, Stop it, cried the shaggy man earnestly. Stop that dreadful noise. The fat man looked at him sadly and began his reply, when he spoke, the music changed, and the words seemed to accompany the noises. At uh, the notes, he said, or rather sang, It isn't a noise that you hear, but music harmonic and clear. My breath makes me play like an organ all day. That brass note is in my left ear. How funny, exclaimed Dorothy. He says his breath makes the music. That's all nonsense, declared the shaggy man. But now the music began again, and they all listened carefully. My lungs are full of reeds like those of organs, therefore, I suppose. If I breathe in or out my nose, the reeds are bound to play. So I breathe to live, you know. Uh, so as I breathe to live, you know, I squeeze out music as I go. I'm very sorry this is so. Forgive my piping, pray. Poor man, said Polychrome. He can't help it. What a great misfortune it is. Yep, replied the shaggy man. We're only obliged to hear this music a short time until we leave him and go away, but this poor fellow must listen to himself as long as he lives. And that is enough to drive me crazy, don't you think so? Don't know, said Button Bright. Toto said, bow wow, and the others laughed. Perhaps that's why he lives all alone, suggested Dorothy. 
Yes, if he had neighbors, they might do him an injury, replied the shaggy man. All this while, the little man, uh, the little fat musicer, was breathing the notes tiddle whittle whittle, oom um, pom pom, and they had to speak loud in order to hear themselves. The shaggy man said, Who are you, sir? The reply came in shape of this sing song. I am Allegro de Capo, a very famous man. Just find another, high or low, to match me if you can. Some people try but can't to play and have to practice every day. But I've been musical always since first my life began. Why, I believe he's proud of it, exclaimed Dorothy. And seems to me I've heard worse music than he makes. Where? asked Button Bright. I've forgotten just now, but Mr. DeCapo is certainly a strange person, isn't he? And perhaps he's the only one of his kind in all the world. This praise seemed to please the little flat, uh, fat musicer, for he swelled out his chest, looked important, and sang as follows. I wear no band around me, and yet I am a band. I do not strain to make my stains, but on the other hand, my toot is always destitute of flats or other errors, to see sharp and be natural are, for me, but minor terrors. I don't quite understand that, said Polychrome with a puzzled look. But perhaps it's because I'm accustomed only to the music of the spheres. What's that? asked Button Bright. Oh, Polly means the atmosphere and hemisphere, I suppose, explained Dorothy. Oh, said Button Bright. Ruff, ruff, said Toto. But the musical musicer was still breathing his constant oom um, pom pom, oom um, pom pom, and it seemed to jar on the shaggy man's nerves. Stop it, can't you? he cried angrily, or breathe in a whisper. Or put a clothespin in your nose. Do something anyhow. But the fat one with a sad look saying his answer, Music hath charms, and it may soothe even the savage, they say. So if savage you feel, just list to my reel, for sooth to say that's the real way. The shaggy man had to laugh at this, and when he laughed, he stretched his donkey mouth wide open. Said Dorothy, I don't know how good his poetry is, but it seems to fit the notes, so, that, uh, so that's all that can be expected. I like it, said Button Bright, who was staring hard at the musicer, his little legs spread wide apart. To the surprise of his companions, the, uh, the boy asked his long question. If I swallowed a mouth organ, would I be, uh, what would I be? An organet, said the shaggy man, but come, my dears, I think the best way we can do... Uh, best thing we can do is to continue on our journey before Button Bright swallows anything. We must try to find that land of Oz, you know. Hearing this speech, the music was saying quickly, If you go to the land of Oz, please take me along, because on Ozma's birthday I'm anxious to play the loveliest song ever was. Oh, thank you, said Dorothy. We prefer to travel alone, but if I see Ozma, I'll tell her you want to come to her birthday party. Let's be going, urged the shaggy man anxiously. Polly was already dancing along the road far in advance, and the others turned to follow her. Toto did not like the fat musicer and made a grab for his chubby leg. Dorothy quickly caught up the growling little dog and hurried after her companions, who were walking faster than usual in order to get out of hearing. They had to climb a hill, and until they got to the top, they could not escape the musicer's monotonous piping um pom pom um pom pom tiddle little whittle um pom pom um pom pom As they passed the brow of the hill, however, and descended on the other side, the sounds gradually died away, whereat they all felt much relieved. I'm glad I don't have to live with them. the organ man, aren't you, Polly? said Dorothy. Yes, indeed, replied the rainbow's daughter. He's nice, declared Button Bright soberly. I hope your Princess Ozma won't invite him to her birthday celebration, remarked the shaggy man. For the fellow's music would drive her guests all crazy. You've given me an idea, Button Bright. I believe the musicer must have swallowed an accordion in his youth. What's accordion? asked the boy. It's a kind of pleading, explained Dorothy, putting down the dog. Woof, woof said Toto, and ran away at a mad gallop to chase a bumblebee.
Chapter 9, Facing the Scootlers. Scootlers, interesting. The country wasn't so pretty now. Before the travelers appeared, a rocky plain covered with hills on which grew nothing green. They were hearing some low mountains, too, and the road, which before had been smooth and pleasant to walk upon, grew rough and uneven. Button Bright's little feet stumbled more than once, and Polychrome ceased her dancing because the walking was now so difficult that she had no trouble to keep warm. It had become afternoon, yet there wasn't a thing for their luncheon except two apples which the shaggy man had taken from the breakfast table. He divided these into four pieces and gave a portion to each of his companions. Dorothy and Button Bright were glad to get theirs, but Polly was satisfied with a small bite, and Toto did not like apples. "'Do you know,' asked the Rainbow's daughter, "'if this is the right road to the Emerald City?' "'No, I don't,' replied Dorothy. But "'It's the only road in this part of the country, so we may as well go to the end of it.' "'It looks now as if it might end pretty soon,' remarked the Shaggy Man. "'And what shall we do if it does?' "'Don't know,' said Button Bright. If I had my magic belt, replied Dorothy thoughtfully, it could do us a lot of good just now. What is your magic belt? asked Polychrome. It's a thing I captured from the Gnome King one day, and it can do most any wonderful thing. But I left it with Ozma, you know, because magic won't work in Kansas, but only in fairy countries. Is this a fairy country? asked Button Bright. I should think you'd know, said the little girl gravely. If it wasn't a fairy country, you wouldn't have a fox's head, and the shaggy man would, couldn't have a donkey head, and the rainbow's daughter wouldn't be vis, uh, would be vis, invisible. Oof. What's that? asked the boy. You don't seem to know anything, Button Bright. Invisible is a thing you can't see. Then Toto's invisible, declared the boy, and Dorothy found he was right. Toto had disappeared from view, but they could hear him barking furiously among the heaps of gray rock be ahead of them. They moved forward a little faster to see what the dog was barking at, and found perched upon a point of rock by the roadside a curious creature. It had the form of a man, middle-sized and rather slender and graceful, but as it sat silent and motionless upon the peak, they could see that its face was black as ink, and it wore a black cloth costume made like a union suit and fitting tight to its skin. Its hands were black, too, and its toes curled down like a bird's. The creature was black all over except its hair, which was fine and yellow, hanging in front of, across the black forehead and cut close to the sides. The eyes, which were fixed steadily upon the barking dog, were small and sparkling and looked like the eyes of a weasel. "'What in the world do you suppose that is?' asked Dorothy in a hushed voice as the little group of travelers stood watching the strange creature. "'Don't know,' said Button Bright. The thing gave a jump and turned half around, sitting in the same place, but with the other side of its body facing them. Instead of being black, it was now pure white, with a face like that of a clown in a circus, and hair of a brilliant purple. The creature could bend either way, and its white toes now curled the same way the black ones on the other side had done. It has a face fo both front and back, whispered Dorothy wonderingly. Only there's no back at all but two fronts. Having made the turn, the being sat motionless as before, while Toto barked louder at the white man than he had before at the black one. Once, said the shaggy man, I had a jumping jack like that with two faces. Was it alive? asked Button Bright. No, replied the shaggy man. It worked on strings and was made of wood. "'Wonder if this works with strings,' said Dorothy. "'But Polychrome cried, "'Look for another creature, just like the first one, "'had suddenly appeared sitting on another rock, "'its black side toward them. "'The two twisted their heads round "'and showed a black face on the white side of one "'and a white face on the black side of the other. "'How curious,' said Polychrome, "'and how loose their heads seem to be. "'Are they friendly to us, do you think?' "'Can't tell, Polly,' replied Dorothy. Let's ask them. The creatures flopped first one way and then the other, showing black or white by turns, and now another joined them, appearing on another road. Our friends had come to a little hollow in the hills, and the place where they now stood was surrounded by jagged peaks of rocks, except where the road ran through. 
Now there are four of them, said the shaggy man. Five, declared Polychrome. Six, said Dorothy. Lots of them, cried Br uh, Button Bright, and so there were quite a row of the two-sided black and white creatures sitting on the rocks all around. Toto stopped barking and ran between Dorothy's feet, where he crouched down as if afraid. The creatures did not look pleasant or friendly, to be sure, and the shaggy man's donkey face became solemn indeed. Ask them who they are and what they want, whispered Dorothy. So the shaggy man called out in a loud voice, Who are you? Scootlers, they yelled in chorus, their voices sharp and shrill. What do you want, called the shaggy man. You, they yelled, pointing their thin fingers at the group, and they all flopped around so they were white and then all flopped back again so they were black. But what do you want us for? asked the shaggy man uneasily. Soup! they all shouted as if with one voice. Goodness me! said Dorothy, trembling a little. The schoolers must be regular cannibals. Don't want to be soup, protested uh, Button Bright, beginning to cry. Hush, dear, said the little girl, trying to comfort him. Don't any of us want to be soup. But don't worry, the shaggy man will take care of us. Will he? asked Polychrome, who did not like the scootlers at all and kept close to Dorothy. I'll try, promised the shaggy man, but he looked worried. Happening just then to feel the love magnet in his pocket, he said to the creatures with more confidence, Don't you love me? Yes, they shouted all together. Then you mustn't harm me or my friends, said the shaggy man friendly. We love you in soup, they yelled, and in a flash turned their white sides to the front. How dreadful, said Dorothy. This is a time, Shaggy Man, when you get loved too much. Don't want to be soup, wailed Button Bright again, and Toto began to whine dismally, as if he didn't want to be soup either. The only thing to do, said the Shaggy Man to his friends in a low tone, is to get out of this pocket in the rocks as soon as we can and leave the scootlers behind us. Follow me, my dears, and don't pay any attention to what they do or say. With this, he began to march along the road to the opening of the rocks ahead, and the others kept close behind him. But the scootlers closed up in front as if to bar their way, and so the shaggy man stopped, uh, stooped down and picked up a loose stone, which he drew at the, uh, threw at the creatures to scare them from the path. At this, the scootlers raised a howl. Two of them picked their heads from their shoulders and hurled them at the shaggy man with such force that he fell over in a heap, greatly astonished. The two now ran forward with swift leaps, caught up their heads, and put them on again, after, they, uh, after which they sprang back into their positions on the rocks. All right, and we are now at our last chapter for story time and then I'm going to after that take a quick break and then come back for game street so chapter 10 escaping the soup kettle the shaggy man got up and felt to a uh, felt of himself to see if he was hurt but he was not one of the heads he struck his breast uh, one of the heads had struck his breast and the other his left shoulder yet though he had knocked the him uh, they had knocked him down. The heads were not hard enough to bruise him. Come on, he said firmly. We've got to get out of here some way. And forward he started again. The scootlers began yelling and throwing their heads in great numbers at our frightened friends. The shaggy man was knocked over again, and so was Button Bright, who kicked his heels against the ground and howled as loud as he could, although he was not hurt a bit. One head struck Do Toto, who first yelped and then grabbed the head by an ear and started running away with it. The scootlers, who had thrown their heads, uh, began to scramble down and run to pick them up with wonderful quickness. But the one whose head Toto had stolen found it hard to get it back again. The head couldn't see the body with either pair of its eyes because the dog was in the way, so the headless scootler stumbled around over the rocks and tripped on them more than once in its effort to regain its top. Toto was trying to get outside the rocks and roll the head down the hill, but some of the other scootlers came to the rescue of their unfortunate comrade and pelted the dog with their own heads until he was obliged to drop his burden and hurry back to Dorothy. 
The little girl and the rainbow's daughter had both escaped the shower of heads, but they saw now that it would be useless to try to run away from the dreadful scootlers. We may as well submit, declared the shaggy man in a rueful voice as he got up upon his feet again. He turned toward their foes and asked, What do you want us to do? Come, they cried, and in a triumphant chorus it at once sprang from the rocks and surrounded their captives on all sides. One funny thing about the Scootlers what the, was that they could walk in there and in either direction, coming or going, without turning around, because they had two faces and, as Dorothy said, two front sides, and their feet were shaped like the letter T upside down. They moved with great rapidity, and there was something about their glittering eyes and contrasting colors and removable heads that inspired the poor prisoners with horror and made them long to escape. But the creatures led their captives away from the rocks in the road, down the hill by the side path, while they came before a lone mountain of rock that looked like a huge bowl turned upside down. At the edge of this mountain was a deep gulf, so deep that when you looked into it, there was nothing but blackness below. Across the gulf was a narrow bridge of rock, and at the other end of the bridge was an arched opening that led into the mountain. Over this bridge the Scootlers led their uh, prisoners through the opening into the mountain, which they found to be an immense hollow dome lighted by several holes in the roof. All around the circular space were built rock houses set close together, each with a door in the front wall. None of these houses was more than six feet wide, but the Scootlers were thin people sideways and did not need much room. So vast was the dome that there was a large space in the middle of the cave. In front of all these houses were the, where the creatures might congregate, as in the great hall. It made Dorothy shudder to see a huge iron kettle suspended by a stout chain in the middle of the, of the place, and underneath the kettle a great heap of kindling wood and shavings ready to light. "'What's that?' asked the shaggy man, drawing back as they approached this place, so that they were forced to push him forward. "'The soup kettle!' yelled the schoolers, and then they shouted in the next breath, "'We're hungry!' Button Bright, holding Dorothy's hand in one chubby fist and Polly's hand in the other, was so affected by this shout that he began to cry again, repeating the protest, "'I don't want to be soup! I don't!' Never mind, said the shaggy man, consolingly. I ought to make enough soup to feed them all. I'm so big. But I'll ask them to put me in the kettle first. All right, said Button Bright more cheerfully. But the schoolers were not ready to make soup yet. They led the captives into a house at the farthest side of the cave, a house somewhat wider than the others. Who lives here? asked the rainbow's daughter. The scootlers nearest her replied, The Queen! It made Dorothy hopeful to learn that a woman ruled over these fierce creatures, but a moment later they were ushered by two or three of the escort into a gloomy, bare room, and her hope died away. But the Queen of the Scootlers proved to be much more dreadful in appearance than any of her people. One side of her was fiery red with jet black hair and green eyes, and the other side of her was bright yellow with crimson hair and black eyes. She wore a short skirt of red and yellow, and her hair, instead of being banged, was a tangle of short curls upon which rested a circular crown of silver, much dented and twisted because the queen had thrown her head at so many things so many times. Her form was lean and bony, and both her faces were deeply wrinkled. "'What have we here?' asked the queen sharply, as our friends were made to stand before her. "'Soup!' cried the guard of Scootlers, speaking together. "'We're not!' said Dorothy indignantly. "'We're nothing of the sort.' "'Ah, but you will be soon,' reported, uh, retorted the queen, a grim smile making her look more dreadful than ever. "'Pardon me, most beautiful vision,' said the shaggy man, bowing before the queen politely. I must request your serene highness to let us go our way without being made into soup, for I own the love magnet, and whoever meets me must love me and all my friends. True, replied the queen, 
We love you very much, so much that we intend to eat your broth with real pleasure. But tell me, do you think I am so beautiful? You won't be at all beautiful if you eat me, he said, shaking his head sadly. Handsome is as handsome does, you know. The queen turned to Button Bright. Do you think I am beautiful, she asked. No, said the boy, you're ugly. I think you're a fright, said Dorothy. If you could see yourself, you'd be terribly scared, added Polly. The queen scowled at them and flopped her red side to her yellow side. Take them away, she commanded the guard, and at six o'clock run them through the meat chopper and start the soup kettle boiling. And put plenty of salt in the broth this time, or I'll punish the cook severely. Any onions, your majesty? asked one of the guard. Plenty of onions and garlic and a dash of red pepper. Now go! The scootlers led the captives away and shut them up in one of the houses, leaving only a single scootler to keep guard. The place was a sort of stone house, a storehouse containing bags of potatoes and baskets of carrots, onions, and turnips. These, said the guard, pointing to the vegetables, we use to flavor our soups with. The prisoners were rather disheartened by this, for they saw no way to escape and did not know how soon it would be six o'clock and time for the meat chopper to begin work. But the shaggy man was brave and did not intend to submit to such a horrible fate without a struggle. I'm going to fight for our lives, he whispered to the children, for if I fail we will be no worse off than, than before, and to sit here quietly until we are made into soup would be foolish and cowardly. The schooler on guard stood near the doorway, turning first his white side toward them, and then his black side, as if he wanted to show to all of his greedy four eyes the sight of so many fat prisoners. The captives sat in a sorrowful group at the other end of the room, except Polychrome, who danced back and forth in the little place to keep herself warm, for she felt a chill of the cave. Whenever she approached the shaggy man, he would whisper something in her ear, and Polly would nod her pretty head as if she understood. The shaggy man told Dorothy and Button Bright to stand before him while he emptied the potatoes out of one of the sacks. When this had been secretly done, little Polychrome, dancing near to the guard, suddenly reached out her hand and slapped his face, the next instant whirling away from him quickly to rejoin her friends. The angry scootler at once picked off his head and hurled it at the rainbow's daughter, but the shaggy man was expecting that and caught the head very neatly, putting it in the sack, which he tied at the mouth. The body of the guard, not having the eyes of its head to guide it, ran here and there in an aimless manner, and the shaggy man easily dodged it and opened the door. Fortunately, there, were no, there was no one in the big cave at that moment, so he told Dorothy and Polly to run as fast as they could for the entrance and out across the narrow bridge. I'll carry Button Bright, he said, for he knew the little boy's legs were too short to run fast. Dorothy picked up Toto and then seized Polly's hands and ran swiftly towards the entrance to the cave. The shaggy man perched Button Bright on his shoulders and ran after them. They moved so quickly and their escape was so wholly unexpected that they had almost reached the bridge when one of the scootlers looked out of his house and saw them. The creature raised a shrill cry that brought all of its fellows bounding out of the numerous doors and at once they started in chase. Dorothy and Polly had reached the bridge and crossed it when the scootlers began throwing their heads. One of the queer missiles struck the shaggy man on his back and nearly knocked him over, but he was at the mouth of the cave now, so he sat down button bright and told the boy to run across the bridge to Dorothy. Then the shaggy man turned around and faced his enemies, standing just outside the opening, and as fast as they threw their heads at him, he caught them and tossed them into the black gulf below. The headless bodies of the foremost scootlers kept the others from running close by but they also threw their heads in an effort to stop the escaping prisoners the shaggy man caught them all and sent them whirling down into the gulf uh, black gulf among them he noticed the crimson and yellow head of the queen and this he tossed after the others with great uh, with right good will 
Presently, every schooler of the lot had thrown its head, and every head was down in the deep gulf, and now the helpless bodies of the creatures were mixed together in the cave and wriggling around in a vain attempt to discover what had become of their heads. The shaggy man laughed and walked across the bridge to rejoin his companions. It was lucky I learned to play baseball when I was young, he remarked, for I caught all those heads easily and never missed one. But come along, little ones, the schoolers would never bother us or anyone else any more. Button Bright was still frightened and kept insisting, I don't want to be a soup, for the victory had been gained so suddenly that the boy could not realize they were free and safe. But the shaggy man assured him that all danger of their being made into soup was now past, as the schoolers would be unable to eat soup for the time, uh, for some time to come. So now, anxious to get away from the horrid, gloomy cave as soon as possible, they hastened up the hillside and regained the road just beyond the place where they had first met the schoolers, and you may be sure they were glad to find their feet on the old familiar path again. All right, so we have reached the end of our story time today. I'm going to take just a little break and then we're going to come back and do a game stream. And Kicken has requested something chill, so uh, we could do a replay of a short hike. There are some great puzzle games. Um, ooh, there's Mist 3. I haven't played Mist 3 yet. I've played the original Mist. So I might do uh, Mist 3 when we come back. So I'm just going to take a little break. I will reply in chat to let you know when the stream is back and when to refresh. And I hope to see you in a few minutes. If not, I hope you have a wonderful day. Next story time is uh, tomorrow, 2 to 4 Pacific time, and we are continuing, or actually we are uh, completing the Hound of the Baskervilles tomorrow. So I'll see you in a few, or I'll see you next time. Bye.